This time, they were certain their belief was justified. On the Russian side, only 90,000 men and a handful of tanks were left on the last defence line in front of Moscow. In desperation, Stalin summoned General Zhukov, who had been organising the defence of Leningrad, and gave him the job of saving the capital. Weeks before, Zhukov had resigned as chief of the general staff after a disagreement with the dictator. But now, Stalin chose to forget their differences. By this time, the situation outside Moscow was critical. On October the 13th, 4th Infantry Army penetrated the last Soviet defence line at Kaluga. At the same time, to the north, 3rd Panzer penetrated to within 90 miles of the capital and looked set to break into the Soviet rear. For the Russians, serious as the situation was on the flanks, in the centre, there was mortal danger. There, 10th Panzer Division and the SS Das Reich Motorized Division had beaten off a furious counter-attack at Borodino. They were now driving up the Smolensk to Moscow Highway, advancing on Mozhaisk, the key to the central sector of the Moscow defence line, and only 60 miles from the city. With the German armies on the threshold of the capital, there was panic in Moscow. Martial law was declared. Government departments and embassies were evacuated. And there was a frantic effort to build last-ditch defences in and around the city. Although the citizens of Moscow expected little mercy from the Germans, in fact, none knew the savage reality of Hitler's plans for the Soviet capital. The German armies had been instructed not to accept its surrender. Its inhabitants might be allowed to flee, but the city was to be obliterated from the face of the earth. In its place was to be built a gigantic reservoir. Almost from the beginning of Operation Typhoon, the weather had deteriorated steadily. The German advance, first in the south and then in the centre, had gradually slowed as the season of rain and sleet had begun. Under the weight of traffic, the three roads on which the whole offensive depended for its supplies were reduced to quagmires. As the rain and snow persisted into a third week, the supply system broke down completely. Eventually, only tracked vehicles could move at all, and their fuel consumption soared, while engines rapidly wore out. Meantime, the troops were living in appalling conditions, permanently wet, cold, and utterly exhausted. The advance slowed to as little as two miles a day. On October the 31st, the German Army High Command ordered a halt in Operation Typhoon. For General Zhukov, the pause was of priceless benefit. Although his forces were desperately weak, down to 190 working tanks, fresh formations were being created at great speed, and in little over a month, 11 new armies would be raised. Although some of the new formations were made up of barely trained conscripts, 
30 divisions would be well-equipped and immensely tough Siberian troops. These had been freed from the eastern frontiers as Soviet intelligence assured Stalin there was no longer a threat from the Japanese. With the Siberians would come a thousand tanks and a thousand aircraft. On November the 7th, in a defiant gesture of normality, the annual Revolution Day parade was held in Moscow. The night before, the first severe frosts had hardened the ground. Only 50 miles from the city, the German armoured columns were once more capable of movement. The last great effort to capture Moscow began on November the 15th. In increasingly heavy falls of snow, and with temperatures sinking ominously, the Germans threw themselves at the Soviet defences. For their part, the Russians, on Zhukov's orders, launched a series of spoiling attacks. Little quarter was given on either side. Both attacking and defending troops knew that this could be a war-winning battle. Facing the German advance on Moscow were three Soviet fronts, Kalinin, West and Southwest. However, it was the six mostly understrength armies of General Zhukov's West Front that would bear the main weight of the assault. The German intention was that 3rd and 4th Panzer armies would cross the Volga Canal and envelop Moscow from the northeast. 2nd Panzer Army would first take Tula, then strike behind Moscow from the southeast to close with the northern pincer. As the Russians reacted and moved to the flanks, 4th Infantry Army would smash in the centre. In two weeks of desperate fighting, in ever more arduous and exhausting conditions, the battle in the north slowly but remorselessly crept towards the Russian capital. However, in the south, against all the odds, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army was being blocked. At Tula, the Soviet 50th Army, in spite of being almost surrounded, could not be dislodged. Then came a stunning blow for the Germans. At Kashira, on November the 27th, a savage attack by well-equipped Siberian infantry, T-34s and new Katyusha rocket launchers inflicted a severe and shocking defeat on Guderian's forces. While Guderian's attack was being blocked, then broken to the north, after ten days of bitter and continuous fighting, 4th Panzer succeeded in crossing the Volga Canal within 20 miles of Moscow and beginning the encirclement of the capital. On December the 2nd, a forward patrol penetrated to within 15 miles of the Kremlin. Hitler and his senior commanders were convinced that one last gargantuan effort would see the final collapse of Russian resistance. It would all depend on the last battalion. On December the 2nd, the first blizzards of winter swept across the German armies facing Moscow. The war in the East was supposed to have been long